Welcome back. If you want to grab your sheets, we'll get, we'll get started now. Just before we start, I just want to assure you all, uh, I was just chatting with our fire chief, the weather alerts that you're getting on your phones. Uh, we are monitoring. Um, there is some potential tornado activity out in the bay. You have all chosen wisely. This is probably the safest place you could be should something happen. Um, so, but I'm sure the fire chief will let us know if, the, if we need to, to duck and, and do anything. So, <laughs> anyways, um, thank you so much for coming back. This has been a, a very quick process and I think we're all very anxious to see with what uh, both Andrea and Ian have come up with. And I'm not going to talk very long. I'm going to turn it over to Andrea who I think is going to kick off the report back. And again, thank you for all of you that uh, came out throughout the week to share your ideas. And uh, over to you, Andre. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How many of you came on Monday or came on Tuesday? OK. <laughs> Well, thank you for doing that. This is intended to be a community-driven process, and we would not be here tonight if it weren't for all of the time and ideas and concerns and, um, and thoughts that you shared with us. I'm sorry the screen is shaking a little bit. We're uh, trying to figure that out. I, I don't know if that's a reflection on what's happening outside or not. projector. This seems like it should come with a warning, right? <laughs> um, my name is Andrea Ostradka. I'm with Tool Design Group. I am an urban designer and transportation planner. I'm here with my colleague Ian Lockwood, who's a livable uh, design engineer. And we have been focused on West Wasaga. We know that this is an important place to you all both because you're residents of West Wasaga or you're concerned residents of the town. Um, this is a really special place. Sorry, let me get the, I forgot the clicker. So Tool Design Group is a transportation and urban realm design and planning firm. We have offices in the U.S. and Canada. Um, we are comprised of just about 300 planners, urban designers, and engineers who are focused on making places better for the people who live and work in them. Uh, we work in many communities about the same size as Wasaga Beach, but I will say that none um, are the same as Wasaga Beach. This is a really special place, and we've really enjoyed being here this week. Some of the things that we've learned about this place are how passionate the residents are, how passionate the business owners are, um, how interesting the history is and the places and how special it is. So we appreciate your hospitality. We wanted to start with the purpose of towns and cities, not to get too far down a historical rabbit hole, but I think that it is important when we think about the future of West Wasaga. So the purpose of towns and cities historically has been to facilitate efficient exchange, exchange of ideas, exchange of goods, exchange of gossip, um, these are things that have been important to societies and generations for thousands of years. And our streets are the public realm in which these exchanges usually happen. And so when you think about the purpose of streets, they're not just to move, they are addresses. They are places where um, we meet people. They are places where we observe things going on. They are places where we exchange. So when we talked to you and others about West Wasaga, we heard a lot of different things, but actually um, it, it seemed like everybody had a lot in common. So that was, that was good to hear. We asked you four questions and we appreciate the time that you spent 
um, thinking through and debating and summarizing what your thoughts are. The first question was about what you like about West Wasaga and that you don't wish to see changed. The main ideas that we heard here, and we summarized all of those uh, poster papers that you created. We know that not everybody got to report out, but we did record every single one. And the gist of that was that, was we heard that you say, the small town feel is important, nature and green spaces are important, uh, peace and quiet, lower density, uh, trees, and just the camaraderie with neighbors. Does this capture a lot of what you said, do you think? Yeah? Okay. Tell me if I'm getting anything wrong, okay? <laughs> now we asked you <laughs> to think about the other end of the spectrum too. What don't you like? What do you wish to see changed? And um, we heard a lot of things in common. We heard quite a bit of frustration with Beechwood we heard that there's a lack of a lot of things, that, that, there, that um, you'd like to see more commercial areas, more shopping, a grocery store, that you would like to have consistent, clear beach access, um, frustration with ditches. Uh, safety was a concern pretty widely across the tables. A concern about density and tall buildings and compatibility with existing structures. Um, we also heard a lot about beauty or lack thereof. Does this generally reflect what you said, do you think? Okay. Good. Our third question about, was about what's missing. And again, we heard a lot of common themes here. Um, shopping, a grocery store, beach access, sidewalks and trails, uh, public spaces, green spaces, preservation of important natural areas. We also heard that there was a need for a school or schools. And then finally, we asked you about your values. And um, this really reflects a lot of the things that came out in the first question. So an appreciation of the small town lifestyle and culture, knowing your neighbors, um, a desire to have a relationship with the land and the natural spaces here, but also to have access to um, amenities like parks, schools, shopping, those sorts of things. Um, we heard that it was important to have spaces to gather and that those are available in other parts of the city, but not necessarily um, easy to find in West Wasaga. So these are the things that we started to think about as we uh, put pen to paper. And they, they come together in a vision. And a vision is really just a consensus among you all of what you want the future of West Wasaga to look like. And generally, we summarized it here. A small town feel, green spaces and protected places, commercial and retail, public access to the beach, a school, and a complete multimodal network. This isn't every single thing, but these, these are the big ideas. And there's only so many letters I can fit on a slide. <laughs> okay, tell me, is this reflective of how you want West Wasaga to be in the future? I see a couple of hands raised. Okay. Noise and pollution, okay, thank you. And what about you? Thank, thank you. Traffic is, is what he said. We are going to come to that in a few minutes. All right, let's get into the details. I'm gonna turn it over to Ian. Great, thank you. Uh, by the way, we figured out what's wrong with the projector and it's got a faulty cable and um, to replace it right now would take about an hour. So <laughs> I think we'll just 
power through, okay? Sound good? So I'm Ian Lockwood uh, with Tools Design Group, and um, I'd like to express my thanks too. We had an enjoyable time. I wish we had more time though. Um, we were working quite late last night, um, and we've, we've tried to um, triage and, and, and do the, draw the most important things that we think will help address uh, those uh, desires that you had. I'm just gonna start with a little background of this idea called path as place. And a, um, a path is anything you, you move down, a street, a road, a, a path, a trail, um, any, any sort of conduit you move along. And the place is where you're at. It could be a town center, it could be a neighborhood, it could be um, the downtown, it could be any sort of place. And the, the idea is that, um, that the path function should not damage the place functions, that the place comes first, not the path. And sometimes the path and the place are the same thing, like at a, on a main street, uh, the main street is a place where you go to meet your friends, to go out for dinner, go to a, see a show, go to a civic building, these sorts of things. It's a place you, you go, you know, window shop. It's also a path that you walk along or bike along or drive along. So it's one and the same, it's, a, it's the same thing. So sometimes a path is part of a place, like here, the path going through the park is not a path um, on its own, it's, it's actually part of the park and it, it should add to your enjoyment of the park. A, a parkway um, through a park system is not a road with a park on each side, it's, a, um, it's part of the park. And so in this case, for example, the parkway comes up the hill, you get enclosed with some trees, you go over the crest and it opens up and creates a great view and you go, wow, look at that great view. So the parkway is to move you physically through the park but also emotionally, it should affect you as you go through. And your streets in your, your town should evoke positive uh, feelings when you're walking through them. You should feel engaged, you should think it's beautiful, it should add to your identity. Your value should be expressed in the streets. So those place functions should influence the path so that you're, you're proud of your streets and you and want to go for walks and you want to go for bike rides and you, you feel proud when visitors come to town. So a path can be equal to its place like this main street, but it's never more important than the main street. So when we designed this main street, we made sure it had nice wide sidewalks and engaging facades and the, and the motors were going slowly. And so I could really relate to that one comment about the traffic and the speed and the noise. One of the things that really contributes a lot to noise is, well, two things, the volume of traffic and also the speed. The faster the traffic goes, the, the higher the noise, especially from the tires. So a path should never dominate the place. And so clearly here, the path dominates its place and those, that lady walking her, her child is not having a very comfortable experience. It's actually it's not pleasant at all. And so some of your streets are being put under a lot of pressure from motorists um, going through the, the volume and um, there's a temptation to try and reward that behavior and that traffic going through and keep it moving. Um, but we, we certainly don't want it to get excessive, excessive in terms of traffic volume and the accommodation being all about the motorists and not about the place, the residents, the addresses, the experience, the identity, being able to walk comfortably and ride your bike. It's hard to read it, eh, when it flashes like that? <laughs> um, so what we really want to think about is the uh, form and aesthetics of the streets. Um, how how your, your buildings address the street and, and we have to think about heights and densities. That came through uh, with a lot of the comments. And there's this rule of thumb that we have that's called like faces like. And so at the top, maybe they have a new cable. Well, it's still, but it's not the right slide. <laughs> Oh. 
Well, it's a little better, I think. Okay. Sure, give it a go. I can pantomime the rest if I have to. Well, that's not too bad. It's kind of wiggly at the bottom. We all right? Is it go? Okay, we're going to go. Okay, so to make a nice street, you want a house facing a house, you want a townhouse facing a townhouse, or retail facing retail, or anything can face an open space, whether it's a house or a um, townhouse. Um, usually we don't have retail facing an open space because um, it kind of kills the energy of the street. You kind of want it on both, both sides. Um, but what we really don't want is a large um, change in scale across the street uh, for, um, it just looks weird. Like <laughs> in, in, so you can see if you have a change in scale, you, you, it ought to happen in the backyard, not across the street. So you can see the change in scale at the backyard. That's usually how you do it. And then there's usually a sort of a terracing up or a transition. So th I thought we would just share that because it might be helpful. Uh, the street network. I think this is probably your largest challenge in the, in the West End is the lack of streets. You've only got kind of one. Um, by the way, does anybody know what this is? The horse, OK. Um, has anyone really seen a horse skeleton ever? <laughs> Probably not, but you know it's a horse. Now the next one's going to be harder. Um, oh, you've all seen it. Okay, good. Manatee, great. You know where this is? Savannah. So you remember that we want a connected network because if there's a crash somewhere, it doesn't shut the whole thing down. If there's maintenance, it doesn't shut it down. Every street is to a human scale and you can access the open spaces, the, the schools, the shops, and so forth. Here, it's completely car dependent. And when you only have one street that goes somewhere, that's the kind of outcome you're going to get. So when you have one street, um, it tends to lend itself to larger development patterns. Um, multiple streets helps break it up into more of a human scale, more of a town scale. And when you assign your trips to the street network, all the trips have to use this one street. And that's what you're suffering from right now. And with multiple streets, you have lots of different routing options. And that typically, the, the trip lengths can be shorter. So that's, it's, it's a really good thing for your town. So this is a before picture of South Bend, Indiana. And they had, this is in their, in their downtown. And they had um, the only, the, a situation where they're only using a few streets. And so it concentrated an awful lot of traffic on two streets in particular, and they made them into one-way pairs. And this was the street that was going away from us. And this happens to be along their waterfront. And it was four lanes, one-way, high-speed street. And so nobody was using the waterfront. And so what we did is we uh, reimagined their street network so that they didn't need four lanes going one way. And we changed it to two lanes, one lane each way. And that became the after picture. And so now there's a separated bike facility, street trees. These are a lot bigger now, by the way. And a sidewalk and one lane each way with, turn, with left turn lanes. And lo and behold, they got investment. Uh, people wanted to be there. The identity went up. People um, went back to the waterfront. It's had a lot of successful outcomes. It, and it... Um, it really advanced the image of the city and the pride of the city, and uh, people wanted to be there. So I'm going to take you back to grade 9 biology. This is how amoebas reproduce. You have one amoeba, amoeba and then it splits into two. Remember, remember that from school? So this lends us to the idea of how roundabouts reproduce. You've seen roundabouts on the highway? So there's a roundabout. And what happens when a roundabout becomes an adult, it's, it starts to stretch. And then it starts to separate like that. And then it splits in two, just like the amoeba. And then you have two new roundabouts. They call them uh, daughter cells. So 
actually, this has nothing to do with reproduction of amoebas, but it has everything to do with the spacing that you need between roundabouts. And so we heard a lot of rumors uh, floating around the community about the minimum spacing between roundabouts, and it could be really close. In fact, if they get so close, they just attach. So there's really no minimum spacing between roundabouts. And these are all real roundabouts. Um, so I just thought we'd, we'd use that so, to kind of explain how it works. So we've got a few roundabouts. Um, we've got a, a couple here. Um, and this is what we call the macro network. Uh, this, these are the streets that you use to go places. And right now, basically, you just have the one that goes places, unless you, you're going a really long distance and you go on the Highway 26. But I want to focus, just for a moment, because we're going to zoom in to the West End in a second, but I just want to focus what we could do in the area. It's, it's outside the city limit, but um, County Road, was it 64, if I remember? 64. 64. And then um, County Road 96. This, this ends at near the dump, and we think we should extend it out to, to 45th Street. And County Road 96 has this, what we call a confluence, where the, the street comes along, and then you have to get on County Road 45 and then go. And the idea is um, not to do that because both streets, all the traffic on both streets have to share this link. And over time, it's not a big issue today, but over time it will become a serious issue. So you really want to do something like that where you extend County Road 64 and that you attach the, these two um, intersections so that both sets of traffic doesn't have to use that as uh, common link. And if you, if you do make those two connections, then it's going to help in the east-west direction in, in the long run. So it's a good idea to do it now because eventually there'll be buildings built which will preclude um, that attachment and so you won't be able to do it in the long run. Um, you need to do that while the land is still available. So let's zoom in. And there it is. There's your street that carries everything. So that street is asked to do all the traffic functions. Um, you bike down it, you walk down it, you have shops on it and addresses for homes. It's being asked to do everything in your community and um, it, if you only have one street, it's really hard for it to do everything well. And so something has to suffer and it's usually the vulnerable users, the pedestrians, the cyclists, the homeowners that have to live on it. What doesn't typically suffer is the motorists. They, they just to get go, go by. And then it gets really busy, and then the, there's the temptation to widen it, which would make it even worse for the residents, the neighborhoods, um, the cyclists, and the pedestrians. So what the problem is, is we only have one street. And it would be so great if we could get a second street to help share the load. And the key is, instead of having um, four lanes um, in the future, if you had two two-lane streets, you could keep your town scale and um, it's easy to cross and it keeps the speeds down. As soon as you get four lanes, you get weaving and overtaking and there's an expectation of speed. And if you can only fit four lanes, you have drivers turning out of the, the center, or the, um, one of the through lanes and you've probably experienced that elsewhere in town where you come up behind a person who is turning left and, you, and there's weaving. So it's really better to have multiple streets like right there. So th that's where we were thinking uh, some sort of fronted street um, along, along 26, something like that. Wow, this is getting really shaky. So this is what we drew. And um, it's a fronted street. It could, go f it could go further west if it wanted to. And it goes around the drainage pond um, along the end of the neighborhood. Um, through these, these, these parcels, and then up um, Ailing Reed Court, and then over into the, the, the what we're calling the um, West End Center here. There's a little street called Burton Avenue that's been started right there. Um, we've, we had to have a name just so we could talk about it, so we called, we called this French Roads Ailing Reed Place. And so now we've got two streets going east-west. I'm getting dizzy. 
now you'll see something, um, and this is why we talked about roundabouts earlier. There's a, a roundabout next to the um, um, roundabouts along 26. And so what we're proposing is to remove the bridge on Fairgrounds Road and put in a, a, another roundabout. And that gives um, access here. So those folks who live here, if you wanted to go a long distance, you could come out to the highway and then go a long distance. And, um, and that actually reduces traffic elsewhere on the, on the road, on, on uh, Beechwood. Uh, similarly, we're thinking about putting a roundabout here, sort of midway. And so you know, anybody living in here, if you wanted to go a long way, you could come out onto the highway and go a long way. Or if Beechwood is getting busy, you could come out here and then use the frontage road to get to the town center or elsewhere. So it would really relieve uh, Beechwood and, uh, and allow you to keep that two lane scale on both streets. So let's take a look at one of these. Um, I took a crack at drawing one. I drew this one just to, <laughs> oh my God, this is hard to look at, um, to see what it might look like. And so there, this is the. <laughs> it worked great on Monday, eh? Yes, ma'am? So the, the, the lady here just said a good idea. She said, why didn't they connect it here? And maybe we could put a roundabout there. Wait for it. <laughs> you may be surprised. Um, yeah, yeah. We were wondering the same thing. Um, so they probably did it just to reward very fast through long distance travel. And by the way, um, the MTO of Ontario is, is thinking of um, building another highway uh, way to the south that will will make this uh, rather redundant. Um, so that's in the books um, to look at. There's a couple of different corridors they're exploring. It's much further away than this one is. Anyway, let's take a peek at um, of this one. So this is the vicinity and that's a, that's about what it could look like and so this is the the proposed roundabout on 26. And so if you're coming at, into your neighborhood, you would, you would come in here and then go straight over to Beechwood. Or if you're going to the, um, to the left, you would go that way. And so, like I showed you at the beginning, um, the spacing's fine. Spacing really matters for signalized intersections because when you get a red light, you get a big backup behind it. That rarely doesn't happen at roundabouts, and you probably notice that yourselves when you're going through these. So that's basically what it would look like, and, and blowing up, it, look, it would look something like this. And you'll notice that um, along this corridor, that we've put a shared use path where you can ride your bike, and there'd be very few interruptions because there's no side streets. So you could ride along there um, without having to stop or any cars crossing your path. And then on the other side, we have a, a sidewalk. And then this is a shared use path going down to Beechwood. And you'll see in a moment how we've created a whole network of trails and paths um, because that's what everybody wanted on Monday. And it's just good planning too. So there, there we are. So I just showed you that one. So this one would be similar. At the town center area, the, the West End Center, we put it further back because we've already got um, Angling Reed Court and there's a street being proposed inside of this area, which I'll show you in a moment. So it just made sense to make that connection. So if you're, if you're going from any of the neighborhoods to, to the town center, you could go there directly like that. So I would like to point out the two entry areas into the West End. And this area would lend itself nicely to a roundabout, wouldn't it? And and then when, so you're coming down um, Highway 26 towards town, and, um, and this is the end of Ramblewood Drive. And then this is, what is it called? Lions Court. Lions Court? So that's where that is, and it would make a very nice entry into to town. Mm-hmm.
Well, let's come back to that point um, in a minute. They're trying to fix the cord. Four times the charm. So th the idea is that it, it goes places, Ramblewood Drive and Mosley. And um, right now, um, actually, let's hold the questions to the end, OK? Because we'll probably answer some of them as we go through. So the idea is that you can go straight. And this, in, this roundabout is going to eventually fail, because it's right now it's the only way um, in. And so with one, two, three support roundabouts, it will help distribute the traffic um, more, red, more evenly. Help. <laughs> yeah, it looks good if I could advance the slides. <laughs> okay. So one of the things about the roundabouts that are out there today, they're not very attractive. And so when you come into town, uh, we should do something nice on those roundabouts. And so we can make it more of an entry feature. So all of these could be welcoming. and right. Today, when you, you get the town feel, you have to get quite a, quite a far ways in. And what we were trying to do here is as soon as you leave 26 to the north, you start experiencing a, a town feel. So all of these blue streets, what we'd like to have on all of them is a, like a shared use path, um, like bike trail, a sidewalk on the other side, and three lanes, one going each way, and then um, in the middle have a left turn lane uh, where you need one. Now along Beechwood, you would probably need more of a continuous left turn lane because there's so many side streets and driveways. That's the tornado going over the roof for anyone who's wondering. <laughs> and so this is what they could look like, and I'll just, I'll just blow one up. So we did a sketch of what Beechwood might be able to look like. Now, it's a 30-meter right-of-way, so we've, we've got space. And what we're proposing is, is one lane each way, and then with the left turn lane to get in and out of driveways. So you'll be able to get in and out of your driveways a whole lot more easily. And then a shared use path where you can ride your bike or walk. It's three and a half meters wide, so it's plenty of space. And then the other side, it'd be a little narrower. Uh, with street trees and a buffer between the Motor, motoring public and um, people walking and cycling. And the idea is to create what we call a sense of enclosure. We want the lanes to be relatively narrow and we want a canopy over the street to help get the speeds down. And for those folks flying between Collingwood and here, it would encourage them to go onto 26, which would lower the traffic volume here, which would reduce the noise and the danger and the interruption of quality of life. Okay, let's look at the other one. So this is Mosley, a little further uh, east. So it's basically the same cross section, except um, smaller, because we only have uh, 20 meters of right of way. But it's the same idea, um, get the left turns out of the travel way, and one lane each way. I just want to point out the pedestrian crossings. I'll use this one here. So when you're standing on the shared use path, you want to cross the street. You only have to look one direction, and then you can cross halfway to what we call the refuge. Then you look the other way and keep going. So that means you only need a gap in one direction. It's, it's very difficult on a busier street to find a gap in both directions at the same time. So this would make it a whole lot easier to cross the street. And we would propose a lot of these um, little uh, refuge islands up and down the street to help people cross, but they also um, reduce the, the um, temptation for
for a motorist to use it to overtake or something stupid like that. Um, so let's look at the trails and the, and the bike routes. So in, in black, down, down Mosley and through the, the neighborhood, there's this um, route that folks take. It's a relatively set, friendly set of streets. It's a bit circuitous. At some places, there's um, a trail where there's no street. And in other places, like here, uh, there's a street that hasn't been built yet, but um, folks use it as a, like a trail. And then there's a, a, another trail down here, just south of Ramblewood. And when we add these streets that we proposed, all of these blue streets would be that three-lane section with a shared-use path. So now, when you're coming down Mosley, you, you have a choice. You can stay on the shared-use path, or you can go through the route, the side route. But we have these loops of friendly streets for walking and cycling here and here and around the town center. And then if you wanted to, to continue these ideas uh, further into to town, you could, you could do that as well. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, we're back. OK, great. So now we've got a a connected network of trails and paths for people on foot and by bike. We've got a human scale with the two lanes, three if you count the turn lanes, um, and, and double the car carrying capacity, but at a, at, a, at a slower speed. And we've got uh, more encouragement to have folks use the um, highway if they're going a long distance. And we have shorter trip lengths because now people can get to where they're going without a long, circuitous uh, route. So let's talk a little bit about the um, West End Center. It's, it's in this vicinity. And this is what the um, current plan looks like. There's some parcels that haven't been laid out yet. This is the casino. And this is what it looks like. And I'll just, <laughs> this is a test. Thank you for your thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, so, so I'm just going to white out everything and then just show you the buildings. And so, there's a lot of parking lot compared to buildings here, and and access ways. <laughs> you know, I have this really great story to tell you. <laughs> it's it's it's, it's um, challenging sometimes. Okay, so. Oh. I hope this is the tornado doing this and not, okay, so here we go. Try it again. So the, the ratio of building to space is pretty low and there's not a lot of relationships between these, these buildings. So I wanna um, bring you to Atlanta, Georgia where we, uh, we were looking at these, this parcel and this is old industrial land and all these industrial buildings were getting torn down and the developer wanted to build a couple of big box um, retail stores. And it could have been just a big parking lot, like you just saw, without parcels tucked in the, in the parking lot. So, we, so I'm going to blow this up. But that's the site plan. And that's what it looks like blowing up. And so the big boxes are near the back. But notice we lined this street. So we created a, a brand new main street with a little public space up here. Tried to hold this, the, the main road here. And so keep that in mind about creating a place. It's, it's just not a, a destination where you have to drive to. You can drive to this place, but you can also walk to it and walk up a nice street, um, have a picnic if you want, whatever you want in the public space, and, um, and even go to a big box store. So this is what the imagination of the street was. Um, very engaging. So let's, let's think about this site. And what would happen if we just rearrange those buildings a little bit, out, re make it not so suburban, and try and make it more like a town center, um, which is kind of the goal. So what if we arranged it like that, and instead of like that, and maybe put in a street network, something like that? So now you've got a little main street here, and maybe we could put a public space. And over time, we could make connections up and down these streets. 
I think we're learning that we don't really need you know, those huge expanses of parking. Um, even at Christmas, I don't know if they, they fill up. But that would create quite a nice environment. And one thing's sh for sure, that this is not the right plan, because I just drew it an hour ago. <laughs> and, but the principles, I think, are what's important. The principle is to connect the streets with a walkable environment. So you can imagine nice sidewalks coming up. Now you really have to imagine nice sidewalks coming up. And with our three-lane street with the separated bike facility. <laughs> so, you know, this is being filmed tonight. And I hope you edit out <laughs> all this stuff so it looks like a smooth meeting. So with that, um, <laughs> is it, am I being punked? Is this like candid camera or something? <laughs> so make sure you pick up your $100 check on your way out for being a great audience. <laughs> is it back yet? No, it's not back yet. We will get through this. We promised you that we would get you out by midnight, and we'll, 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 tr we'll try and make that deadline. Yeah, the storm will be over. Sure, go ahead, ask a question. So the question is, there's so much land used for parking, why can't we have like three stories, like a parkade or something somewhere. The, um, the short answer is that it's really expensive to build parking garages. However, that, that one we showed you in Atlanta and other ones like that, we do design the parking lots, the surface parking lots, to eventually become parkades over time as more density moves in and when the, when the um, math works. So a well-designed um, first generation of buildings like this one is, those parking lots ought to be designed so that over time it can fill in. And I don't think that's quite the situation with the current design. But with the design I showed, you can size the, the areas behind the buildings so that eventually you get a parking deck and more density and maybe, um, maybe three-story buildings with housing above some of the shops and that kind of thing. What, um, I'll just describe some of the ideas in there while, while they're fixing the slide, the slideshow. Um, those streets uh, that we drew will have parking on the sides. And for those of you who have been to Collingwood's Main Street, you notice they have the, the angle parking on the sides. So we could have that. And so the front of the stores have that very convenient parking. Um, and you get about twice as much parking with angle parking as you do with parallel parking. And then, so for most of the time, you could probably just find a space there. Yeah, so in here, we could have angle parking, and then down here. And then for overflow times, you know, the parking would fill up at the back. So you could create a really nice kind of um, walking experience with that sort of buffer between you and the, and the traveling uh, motorists. And these are the, these little arrows indicate access ways into the parking fields. And again, this is just one idea. There's probably 15 other ways you could arrange this site to, get, to fulfill these principles where buildings actually hold the streets. And, and I think this is something that we heard a lot of about um, the quality of the walking experience. Like the very first word we heard when we asked, what do you want um, for the town in the future was walkability. That was the first thing that came um, out of somebody's mouth was walkability. And the, um, let's go back. That, that isn't walkable. You, it's all for driving. And, um, and I'll just point out that there are, um, uh, what do you call them, um, drive-throughs at a lot of these buildings. And so it's designed for, for just people in cars. And you can have um, drive throughs in the back if you really want to drive through. Anyway, um, 
So something like that would make sense. And then we thought that this street's coming through. That's part of that frontage road that we showed you. And that, that would make a good place for a school, you know, right near all the shops um, and, the, and, the, and the West End Center. So an elementary school, they, they need somewhere between six and eight acres, and we thought that might fit in well near the, um, you know, the West End Center. So the bottom line is that when your town first developed, it was at a walking scale. And there's Leonardo da Vinci, the, the streets, the buildings, the furniture and everything, historically was at a walking you know, human scale. And then it changed after World War II. This is his updated drawing. Um, where it changed to a, a car scale. And the idea is we want to change it back through network, uh, through slowing things down, through a sense of enclosure, through street trees between the sidewalk and the, um, the travel lane to get that town feel back. So those are ideas. And um, I want to thank you for coming out on Monday night and also on Tuesday and tonight. So maybe somebody could turn on the lights there in that back corner in that hatch, and we can um, we can have a discussion and answer any questions that folks might have. So everyone who asks questions is sitting on that side of the room, <laughs> but if there's any questions on this side, we'll do some. So we'll go here first, and then back there. Yes, ma'am. So, good question. She asked, will there be an entrance to the casino? Let's go back. So there's the casino, and with a three-lane street, you can, you'll use the center lane to turn in here. Um, and also, you could turn in um, over here and here, or you could, you could come through here if you wanted. So it'll be much more permeable than it is today. But the nice thing is you can access it not just with your car, but also on foot and by bike. Yeah. So you notice that, um, remember those blue lines? That Those blue lines that I showed you on, all those streets have a sidewalk on one side and a shared use path on the other. So you can walk on either side of any of those streets. That's the idea. And it fits within your existing right of so You don't have to expropriate land for the existing streets, but getting the, um, the new street, you might have to take some land. Let's go back to it. Oh, it's actually in the other direction too. So all of these uh, blue streets, and you'll see them, they all go around the casino and everything, have sidewalks on, effectively sidewalks on both sides, and the way to turn in. Right now, this scale has been made four lanes to here uh, by the MTO. And by, by spreading the traffic out, like a lot of the traffic doesn't have to get down here anymore. It could come here and here if you live in this area. The idea is um, you can make it more accessible because you're not putting all the traffic on one street like they, they did with their current system, their current imagination. If someone's coming from Mosley, and they have to cross the street to get to the casino. Can they, are you gonna have an entrance, like a sidewalk or a pathway? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's right in front of the speaker. You have to be careful, it's gonna feedback. Yeah, so the question is, when you're walking down the sidewalk, um, can you cross the street? And the, the intent is to um, have crossings at the roundabouts, and I didn't, I didn't dwell on it too much, but when I showed you the, um, the roundabout that we designed, I'll just go back to it. So a well-designed roundabout looks like this. You have a what's called a slow in, slow out approach. So the motors are going pretty slowly as they um, go across the crossing. The crosswalk, you see there's crosswalks on all four sides. The crosswalk is usually one car length behind the where you yield. And it's the second car that yields to the pedestrians, not the, because the car, the driver here is looking for an opening. The, the problem with the current roundabouts is they have a tangential um, 
approach and exit. So you can come off really fast. And when, when that happens, the yield rates go down, and so they don't yield to pedestrians. So we need to change the geometry to create that. So when you're coming in, you have to deflect a little bit. When you're going out, you have to deflect. And that helps with the yield rates. So they're on all four sides. Furthermore, when we get back to um, what you're talking about right here, we could have um, one of those islands halfway down because it's a three-lane street, and we could have a maybe we have another crossing. Um, so the idea is to make it walkable, so you can walk along each side and cross more often. And that's the goal. So there's a question here, somewhere, sir, blue shirt. So yeah, first uh, I apologize. You're gonna have to live with my French. Uh, Sense. You have to hold the mic close to your mouth. Okay, so my first question is about this new road. I think it's a fantastic uh, idea. It's a great vision. It's only a vision because uh, Highway 26 is, uh, belongs to the MTO, not to the town, and you will have to create uh, three or four new exits. And uh, the new road, we will have to buy, mo most of it is on private land. That means the town will have to buy the private land and create all this new roundabout. I, I would expect like a $10 million, I suppose, so just like that. I know that widening mostly right now, we still have 2.8 million to pay to finish, to, to widen it. So it's a fantastic vision, but it's gonna cost a lot. I would love it to, to happen. I love roundabout, by the way, nothing's better. So that's my first question. Okay, from thank the, you. From the vision, so, so the from question the vision to reality, what's the timeline and what's the cost? So let me see if I can paraphrase. The question is um, that this is a vision and it's gonna cost a lot of money because you have to pay for the roundabouts and you have to get the right of way. The, um, so yes, first, there's two things. It's, it's going to cost money and it's difficult because it goes through uh, the back ends of people's properties. And um, most of them are undeveloped now, so that makes it easier. However, the cost of not doing this is probably higher because this street is going to get hammered with more traffic. You're going to get 3,000 or so more dwelling units here, which is 20-something percent in addition to the, to the dwelling units in the entire town. So there's a lot of new drivers gonna be coming in here, and if they have to use this street, it's going to create problems on the street, it's going to cross, create an appetite to change that street to be more car-oriented, which is going to make it more difficult to cross. There'll be safety issues, uh, there'll be image issues. So yes, this is difficult, but as, um, was it Sherlock Holmes said, <laughs> oh, um, once you eliminate all of the uh, things that are impossible, what's ever left, however unlikely is the truth, there is no silver bullet that's going to solve all the issues of this development happening when you only have one street doing everything. And so it's hard either way, but I would suggest based on your values that you shared with us that Andrea went over about small town values and all that sort of thing, if you want those in your future, you really need more network because this development's coming and if you don't have another street, um, you're gonna end up with like four lanes worth of problems on a two lane street and that's gonna be tricky. So I don't wanna sound negative. But Could you get the yeah. mic, Andre? I, I, again, I love <laughs> you have a second the idea. question? Yes, again, I love the idea, so I don't wanna sound negative at all. Huh? I just hope that the council will actually, you know, go for it. So. My second question is, we've been talking a lot about the streets. I understand that's uh, your vision around the streets, but the streets and roads are only one part of the West Wasaga plan, I believe. What about the, all the developments? Uh, I'd like to hear more about the official plan and zoning bylaw. What are the plans for development sure. on the uh, West Wasaga? So the question is about the land uses, like what about all the other things besides the streets? Um, I'll come to that, but I just want to point out that um, when you saw Savannah, those streets were laid out in 1780 or something like that, 
and they're still there today. Same streets, car wasn't even invented then. The land uses have turned over three or four times. So I know a lot of people want to talk about the land uses, but a lot of the land uses, especially the commercial things, will probably not be here in a century from now. But a century from now, whatever street network we put in will be here. And even in the next 20 years, if we don't put this street in, it will be precluded. Someone will build something in the way, and then you have an inadequate um, skeleton, and you're, you will have an underperforming town. So I would suggest that the street network is your biggest problem and needs your attention. The land uses, um, there are property rights, there's form, there's design, there's a huge discussion. And um, we focused on the West End Center about how to position buildings and so forth. We also shared a principle about how to address a street. But we're in, let's see, we did our stakeholder meetings Tuesday and we did our tour and stuff Monday. So yesterday we had to solve all of these issues and provide as much guidance as we could in terms of land use. But um, we're certainly not, you know, in 12 hours with two people going to solve all of your land use issues. So, but we do share a lot of your values, and I think those values should inform the land use um, visions and so forth moving forward, in addition to what we've already said. So, Andrea, you found somebody with a question? So, so get it, get, if you want to have a question, make sure you just um, wave to our Andrea, who's got the microphone. So the question is about costs. So that's a, that's a, there's money coming in and money going out, right? And so we want to build things that attract money coming in, which will be a lot of what will be here. Tell you what, let's use the microphone and Andrea will get to you because no one can hear what you're saying. So let's, let's get to that lady with the microphone. Hi, first of all, thank you. I applaud you guys for doing all this in such short time. My question is, it's going back to the roundabout on Highway 26 in Lions Court. I live in that vicinity. The traffic noise is horrendous. If you were going to create another exit off of Highway 26 into the town there, that's going to impede on very high traffic volume going through a residential area. It's also going to increase the noise pollution and the light pollution. The reason that was blocked off to begin with was to alleviate the traffic on Beechwood Road. And I'm not sure why that's going in there. So the principle is um, this mostly, which also goes through residential areas, can't handle all the, is all the traffic. The, um, so we want to share the load. That's why we showed two other streets connecting over this way. So now there's four. If there were more streets, we would connect them all. And the other thing is that if, if everybody who had a street going near them, like there's, there's some proposed streets here, but nobody wants additional streets going through their area. But a, if everyone vetoed a street, then we would, um, like I imagine the folks living down here may not want the street here. The, the, um, if we don't add network, we're going to focus all the traffic on too few streets and then they will, they will get widened. It, I think it's in the collective interest to share the loads. And with respect to the noise, the biggest contributor to noise is probably the engine and the tires. And those noises go up. We have no quarrel with having folks going slowly. We're proposing on, on Beechwood to change this the speed limit from, I think it's 70K to 50K. And um, then also, these streets should be slow as well, and maybe they should be 30K. Like, um, we, I can't hear you without the microphone. There's schools on that street. There's residents mm -hmm. on that street. 
it's just, it's going to create, it's going to be the first exit off the highway into the beach, which is going to increase the traffic in that area, which is residential. It's, I, I understand what you're doing. I applaud you. But there's got to be another way, or the people in that area need to be protected from the noise and the high traffic. Like, it's, something has to be done to protect the residents. Part of our quality was for quiet streets, peaceful mm -hmm. streets, avoiding po noise pollution. That's not going to solve anything. So I think everyone in the room agrees with you that we want quieter, slower streets. And if we only have one street, that's impossible. And so, but we're, so if, if this was easy, you wouldn't have hired out a town consultant to help you. And there's not enough um, network to spread the load. And this street actually goes someplace. It's, we call it a framework street. We don't, we don't have no quarrel, though, with narrowing it, calming it, putting trees on it. What, there was, um, I went to Carleton University in, in Ottawa. And uh, in, during my, my graduate studies, I studied traffic calming, actually, about um, 40 or 50 years ago, when nobody's talking about traffic coming. And shortly after graduation, Carl University hired my, my firm at the time to study all the cut through traffic going through Carl University. Because it was lowering the quality of life, it was, it was noisy, it was endangering the students who were trying to cross the street. And, um, and the, the idea was that all these folks were cutting through the university um, scaring everybody and endangering everybody. So we did a license plate trace. And so we, we recorded the license plates of every car coming in from every direction. And it turned out that the folks coming in and out were going to or from Carlton University. And I think 10%, five to 10%, it was a low number, was actually going all the way through the campus. But 90% of the drivers were speeding and being reckless. And so the conclusion was that a lot of the problems are caused by the, the people themselves. And you'll probably find that if you did a, um, you don't have to do license plates trace anymore. You can, um, you can use phone data to track where people are coming to and going from. And I suspect a lot of folks who are creating problems in your community are probably yourselves because the streets encourage it. Some of these streets are so straight, they look like a highway. You know, you want to go quickly. And um, what we're proposing is slowing things down. And once you do slow things down, like um, I've, I've helped traffic on many different cities. And once we slow the streets down, the, the residents come to us and say, thank God you did that. Our quality of life has gone way up. Because they were concerned about the noise and the danger and the school kids and so forth. And they thought well, the traffic's probably cut in half and everyone's going slowly. It's great. It turned out that the volume didn't change at all. It's really the behaviors that are the, the biggest issue, not so much the, um, the volume. We're trying to keep, get the volume down too, but the, the key is to change the behaviors. And I suspect that your street is probably straight and conventional and uncalmed, and maybe that's um, a big contributor to the problem. But the bigger problem in your whole town is no network. So let's, let's change the subject because we can debate this all night. Um, let's, let's get another different question. Did you look at Beechwood and Blue Gate area? Um, there's a huge development proposed for across the street. And it also has fairground roads running beside it. I think if you're going to put 3,000, talk about 3,000 residents going along that one um, Beechwood, that these places should be looking at another entrance to come on and off, have an exit entrance. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, so with this concept, they have another entrance off of this street, because these are pretty large developments. Most of them are large enough that they can at attract, or sorry, attach to both streets. So we're trying to make it so that they don't all have to use that one street. Most of these developments go from Beachwood all the way to this proposed street. Over here, um, it's a, a triangular site, and we would have to work 
some way to get them to have access from both sides. And it would make sense to access from both sides so that they're not forced to go up to Beechwood to get in if they're coming from out of town, for example. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense um, to make it accessible from both sides. Where's Andrea? Uh, so if you're trying to ask a question, get her attention because she's got the microphone. Yes. Hi, sorry. I'm confused. I thought this exercise was to talk about how we want to develop our West End. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing a lot of assumptions about 3,000 units. The development is going in, like your language seems like this is set in stone. Maybe I'm looking at council to find out what's going on because, you know, and I understand your expertise is in traffic patterns. And perhaps all we're trying to do here is talk about how to, are we just talking about how to facilitate these developments to make them more drivable? Because I think our concerns are pretty resounding. We want to keep our small community feel, keep uh -huh. low density and not rack them and stack them all along Beechwood. And the language I'm hearing now is that there are 3,000 units going in. And I thought this exercise was something different. That, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So I am a transportation person, so probably I lean that way. Um, Andrea is a land use person, so our team was balanced, even though I'm standing up here. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of units in these developments. And if, um, if you think there's too much and they're too dense, too dense, share that with the council. But we're, we're not in a position to um, re, re, um, what is it, replan their uh, applications. But we are in a position to help with the, the form, um, the access, and if it's too much, um, it, that's, that's definitely a, a political question. It's, um, and it's important. There are certain zones and rules and so forth, and I, I'm, I am not the expert on that, but I hear you, it's not just um, about access. I think still that's the, that's the most important issue happening. I would also suggest too that um, some of the land use changes that are being proposed actually help reduce traffic. Like all of these <clears throat> land uses that are being proposed in here, or a lot of them anyway, are things that are missing in the neighborhood. So today, you have to drive down to 45th or something for a grocery store. You have to drive a long way to get other things. Here you'll drive a lot shorter distance and so you don't have to drive through you know, further up to 45th Street. So some of the things will actually help reduce traffic. The housing will add to it. And um, you, ne you need a certain amount of rooftops to, to, um, to attract a grocery store and a, you know, whatever goes in here. So, that's something that, um, again, we, we, if we had a lot more time to work with these developers on their portfolios and their that sort of thing, we would, we would be happy to do that. Next, Sandra, can we pick the next person, please? Yes. Thank you very much for anybody that helped organize this. Urban planning is essential to everybody's future. I really appreciate it. One of my primary concerns was I like the small town feel. Like everybody else, I don't want a big road in my backyard, but I keep hearing you talk about roundabouts. We have two provincial roundabouts right now that are disgusting. We have no signs for our town on that end of the beach. Five more provincial um, MTO roundabouts that aren't gonna be maintained, I don't think it's gonna beautify anything invite people to the beach. So I think um, if we had more than four days, we probably could have drawn, uh, remember I drew a circle around here and here. We also are saying that anything in blue should feel like the town. Right now, the, the kind of the, the highway feel comes deeply into your community, like the, this bridge starts way over here and goes over. Like um, the edge of the town needs to come up to the highway and not have these protrusions coming in. These roundabouts, again, are designed um, for highways. 
not for a city or a, a town. And yeah, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. So the the it's very difficult to cross here because again the tangent coming into the roundabout encourages excessive speeds. The um, scale of the roundabouts in here is is too high. It's too big. It's 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 very similar to this roundabout. And I, I'm not surprised because of the folks who delivered them. But this roundabout, if these are three-lane streets, can be um, smaller with a slower approach and exit, which makes them more friendly. And we also showed three examples of better landscaping because they're pretty utilitarian. And the reason they're designed like that is because the MTO doesn't want to have to maintain that. And if, there's, if this is in the public realm in a town, it should be attractive. And it should have some trees, and it should it should have sidewalks, and it should have some landscape, and that's what we drew in our that one example we actually drew is here. So the provincial roundabouts would stay on the highway, but once you get to here, um, and we didn't have time to draw it out, but um, there's something called an entry sequence, and when you have a town and a highway coming along that goes in the town, becomes the main street, let's say, and exits the town and becomes a highway again, the smart thing to do is a sequence where the, the um, cross-section changes. Instead of um, rural shoulders, maybe you have curb, where there's no trees, now you start to have trees and street lights, and the vocabulary of the design changes from highway to town over a, a length of period. A length of the street so that um, when you come in by the time you get to the town you're going at town speeds and that's not happening today people are coming in here too fast they're hot and they get right to the sensitive parts of town too quickly so what we want to do is make that entry sequence happen and the fastest way to change behavior from one side to the other is through a, a roundabout that one and that one, because you can have one completely different environment on one side of the roundabout, and then when you leave the roundabout, it can be really nice. And so that's what we drew here, and that's what you want to replicate in these other two approaches. Or oh. so, so I'll answer this question, then we'll move on. And, if, the mic, if you don't have a mic, don't ask a question, please, because Andrea's got someone lined up. So the question was, I haven't been here on a long weekend, and slowing down the streets won't help on a long weekend. So there's a difference between um, traffic volume and traffic speed. And you actually move plenty of traffic at a, a safer, quieter speed. If you move them quickly, then um, that's, what, that's the problem. Speed, high speed, is the pathogen of towns and cities. It's, it makes the streets uncomfortable for everybody. So we, we were not going to preclude anybody by designing streets to be designed to be slower. And when you design something to be slower, that's different than designing it to be congested. Congestion is not a good thing, and that's why we want a network of streets. But we want, even if it's off season, at three in the afternoon, it's not peak hour or anything, we, w we still want people to go slowly. So it's, it's, we want them to go slowly during normal hours, off season, and in peak hours, you don't need a traffic calm street because the other cars are slowing folks down. But we don't want to rely on that. We want it to be slow at nighttime, we want it to be slow in the evening, we want it to be slow um, at all times. So speed and traffic congestion and so forth are different issues, and we want your streets to be slow and comfortable all the time, 24-7, 365 days a year. Thanks. Who's paying for all of this construction? So yeah, that's a good question. Who's paying for it? And, and like the gentleman mentioned earlier, it's going to cost money to do all these things. So um, the, the, it'll have to be through development, grants, and, and taxes. Those are the three. Um, or the MTO, because the MTO actually created a lot of these issues for you. And so perhaps they should be on the hook for some of the cost too. So I think you should pursue a lot of funding mechanisms. 
the and again it's going it, to the inserting a new street into a city is very difficult closing a street is easy um, but i think for you your town this is necessary this this was this was not planned well to have one street do everything and it's never going to be easier than it is today to put the street in. It's very difficult, but every decade that goes by, it will be either precluded or impossible to do this. And you can hope for a miracle, like down the road, but without the right bone structure, it's, um, I, I don't see it being, I don't see your West End being successful. That's how important this is. It's, it's, it's probably your last chance to get street network in your community. Who's paying for it? MPTO, taxes, developers, and grants. It's okay. I'm going to be the elephant in the room. So this whole streetscape would have happened if developer wasn't coming. So that's part one of the question. So when the developer comes and he builds these 3,000 homes, do they not assume the responsibility for paying for these roads, seeing that it's their sure. development? So it shouldn't be costing us taxpayers anything, really. Good point. So that was one of the, on the list. So if you can get, um, the developers typically like to just work on their property and externalize their issues on society and have someone else pay for it. And that's rational in their self-interest. And the, um, if you can incentivize them to, through rules, regulations, code, whatever, to contribute to the solution financially, that, that's a plus. And if they're helping creating the problem, they should help with the solution too. So I don't think it's a, a, too much of an elephant in the room. I think it's a good idea, actually. Yes, sir. I get the transportation issues that you've got, and I understand clearly, too, that there's a fairly large onslaught of people that are going to arrive at Wasega Beach over the next uh, period of years. But I think part of what the problem is here is this low dense or this high density and this um, low income housing. There's this huge push. All of these developers are now what used to be estate lots are now crowding 15 houses into that same lot. And so it really does become the developer's issue as far as this transportation is concerned. But I had thought really that you were gonna help us calm that uh, high density situation down, but you haven't. You've, you've just facilitated moving the people. Uh, and I realize that has to be done too, but the bigger part of the job is to look after that high density, and I think that's what is on everybody's issue here. Well, I'll differ with you on what's the biggest issue. I think your lack of network is the bigger issue because you have a very short period of time to secure that. But I do think you should talk about your densities and we also heard a lot about affordable housing. There's a lot of people in their 30s and 40s who can't afford a house here. Uh, there's a lot of workforce housing that's not here. Um, so you've got a couple of problems. One is um, the community is so desirable that younger folks can't afford to buy a house here. So, and how do you um, do that? Um, estate lots with an affordable house on it doesn't make a lot of sense from a land use perspective or an efficiency perspective. If you build affordable housing out here, let's say, you can't because it's an agricultural area, but that's protected. But if you could, then those folks will be driving through. And so you're gonna get traffic from them. Um, if there's demand, they'll, they'll live out here and then they'll become car dependent and they'll go through this sparse network that you have and cause other issues. So, it's not just as simple as we like our low density and we want to keep more of it. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a, a complex issue. And I think your, your staff understands about affordability. They understand about density. Um, and 
and the lack of um, access and uh, streets. So it's, it's a combination of things that have to be considered. Hi. Um, I love the plan. I think the blue streets are great. Um, I also love the roundabouts. No problem with them. I also love the fact that you're having three roads coming off of the highway rather than one. It makes perfectly good sense to me. So I'll be the minimum. The, the, the one person in the room is actually standing up and saying, I like it. Well, actually, Gerard did too. Um, I'm all about regional thinking. So I see that you've got a red line with uh, an arrow at the end. There's a lot of traffic, uh, particularly by bicycle, between Wasaga Beach and Collingwood. And currently, people use the train trail, which is taking ourselves out of the way. Is there any chance that we can collaborate with Collingwood and get that secondary road going all the way through to Collingwood? Because realistically, they're going to be doing exactly the same thing we're doing coming our way. That's a really good question. So the, if they don't do something like this too, and maybe do another access point, and if they don't do a, a blue street here, that's a complete street with sidewalks and bike facilities, all the issues that we're concerned about on this part of Beachwood will come to here. And um, they came to visit with us while we were here, and we talked to them. And I think um, because our jurisdiction ended here, that's why the blue line ended here. But we would encourage Collingwood to continue this all the way down towards their roundabout. And we would also encourage them to create a shared use path all the way to Collingwood so you can comfortably ride your bicycle uh, there from here. One of the, the, I know everyone's concerned about motor, motor vehicles traffic, but the route to, to, to the downtown and other places is pretty flat along the, um, the shore area. And so if we provide a comfortable bike facility, I suspect a lot of people will start to ride bikes. Today, it's out of the question because it's so uncomfortable to ride your bike on those, on those streets. But if you had a you know, four meter wide path and trees before you get to the traffic, um, it would be quite comfortable. And I imagine um, a lot of people do it because it's not all that far on a bike. It's far to walk, but it's not all that far on a bike. And, and that will actually help um, from a traffic perspective too because you have all, all these discretionary trips that are now taking uh, cars, can, you can ride your bike. I, I, I just wanted to mention, and I certainly understand the road network as uh, well, but I think we, uh, the screen was pretty shaky uh, when you were going through uh, the like to like, and uh, I think that addresses some of the concern here, is that uh, in the meeting we had, we talked about that extensively the other morning, and uh, where you uh, transition density so that you're uh, matching uh, density uh, across the road so that you're getting like density built beside you and that it would gradually escalate, uh, uh, that it uh, could be at some point uh, higher density and then it would transition back down. Uh, you know, the other day we were talking about laneways and hiding a lot of parking and and certainly uh, when we did our training session, there was a little more opportunity to show some of the before and after uh, that uh, you, uh, the projects you have done. And I, I think that would alleviate some of the concern. As uh, we as a municipality can't stop growth. People are going to come here. Uh, we are creatures of pro provincial legislation and uh, there will be growth, and but growth can be beautiful. It, it, I think so many people vision that it's going to be something very bad and very ugly, and uh, with good planning, it can be very beautiful. And it, and if you create beautiful place with people, it attracts tremendous investment, so that you do get. Uh, a beautiful center with the commercial you're looking for and potentially a theater or restaurants or whatever. So I, I think human nature is that we envision the worst possible outcome. And what this exercise is about 
is trying to deliver the best possible outcome. So I don't know if you want to revisit that one slide with like to like. Yeah, I, I would actually. <laughs> um, but I, I want to describe, uh, when we first got here, we, we did a PowerPoint for the staff about um, a lot of urban design principles. And we had this idea of A streets and B streets. And in A street, all of, all of the streets that are shown up here would be A streets. They're, they're also framework streets because they actually get you to places. And, and these are the streets where people's image is made of your town. This, because this, these are the streets that people experience every trip, right? Um, not a lot of people drive on that street, but he, the, this street, a lot of people go on it. This street, a lot of people go on it. And that's how people make their, their image of Osaka Beach. And on an A street, you want the fronts of the buildings facing the street. You want what we call natural surveillance looking over the sidewalk, doors, windows, and so forth. To make a, a nice walk, everyone said walkability was really important. You don't want the sidewalk interrupted with lots of driveways. You don't want cars parked over driveways. And, and so on those streets facing any of these framework streets, what we would recommend is a lane behind the, the houses or whatever is there, or an alley, whatever you call it. And that's where you park and so forth. So when you're walking along the A side, all these streets, it's a completely uninterrupted walk. It's actually quite a nice walk. And we showed some examples on Monday of very dense places, but incredibly walkable and, and beautiful with street trees. And um, they're really, really handsome. Now, if the, those same density, exact same densities had driveways every so many uh, meters, it would look terrible. It, it, would, it would look like cars live here. People don't live here. And so form is really important. How you, your, your guidelines on how these, these buildings get built, they could be extremely beautiful or it can be extremely ugly. Uh, same use, same density, it can have completely different outcomes depending on its design. And I, I suppose we could have gone into that tonight a little bit. Um, I think Andrea probably wanted to do that. We didn't, we ran out of time before uh, we had to be here. I don't know if you want to look at, pull up Baldwin Park and we can go through that um, yeah, if you want. Yeah, well, so we'll check those questions while people ask other ones and maybe we can, um, maybe one of the other staff folks can um, pass around the microphone while Andrea finds those slides because that would be really cool. So, yes sir? So I have a uh, comment and a question. Um, the comment is on the 20 meter right of way you had up. It had street lights on one side of the road and utilities uh, on the other. It'd probably be best to uh, consolidate all your utilities to one side of the road to prevent um, uh, multiple poles on each side of the road. <clears throat> was it was it before this or after? Was it after this? Uh, I think it's still before. So we go backwards, okay. No, it's, a, it's the other way, sorry. Yeah, I'll go through that section in yeah, detail. Yeah, that's fine. And then um, my question was back to the um, uh, Highway 26 highway. You, with adding those four um, roundabouts, is the MTO going to have a problem with the 80 kilometer an hour and 90 kilometer an hour speed limits? Could yeah, they are, yeah. So, That's the one. so the MTO's values are very different than yours, and, but they are having a huge effect on your community. And I would suggest that there needs to be a, a very serious conversation with them about uh, creating contributing infrastructure instead of harming infrastructure. I think there's a, and I, we heard it from a lot of folks, um, in fact, when we did our meeting on Monday, I think four out of the six groups said we have insufficient access to 26. And so we tried to ameliorate that with the um, access, and that has a bunch of benefits. It doesn't change the speed limit on their street, though, because those, they already have two roundabouts and they work fine with what's going on. So that's fine, but it's the, it's the um, because there's so little access, it requires anyone going anywhere long distance to travel so far in the community before they can get access to the to 26, which means more traffic on streets that aren't suited for more traffic. 
But let's go over this cross section here. So there's, there's street lights on both sides and there's power poles on one side. And the right of way is pretty narrow, it's 20 meters. And we put the poles as far back as we could away from the street trees so that um, you can actually have branches on the trees. So we didn't locate the utility poles here. We located them here. And the reason we did this pedestal sort of scale lighting is to, to kind of reward that um, human scale. And so you can light both the, the sidewalk or the shared use path and the street with the same lights. So you don't have those really high cobra heads. And it's the same here, except um, we can have more generous widths because we have more right of way here. And in this one, the power poles are quite far back because we can actually have a little bit of space within the existing right of way to put, put, put those poles. So you walk around and just uh, see who wants to ask another question. You can play Ivana White here. You know. Hi, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of upset because I feel like I almost wasted three days coming out. I understand that these roads need to be built to move traffic, but my main concern, and I think our whole area, we are in uh, Blue Water, is concerned on the high density across the road. When I go to the other end, and I'm speaking especially to the council now, when I go to the other end of Wasaga Beach, you go to the Walmart area, those homes in there look very beachy, they're very nice. You go a little bit further down, it looks like dominoes all in there, just um, three-story townhouses, just this way, that way, this way, that way. And that's what I'm afraid is going to happen across the road because we've got stacked townhouses, so are they going to even be taller than those? And you're looking at four-story, four apartment buildings? I mean, that whole area is going to, I don't know, I'm really afraid that it's just going to be destroyed. Um, it, what? It's not like to like. It's not well, like to like, yeah. So clearly, are oh, you finished your question? Yeah. So I think um, we've heard pretty loud and clear that we need to address this. There needs to be a longer conversation about this. We have to get to, the, to um, a remedy because I think everyone in the room feels very similarly to you or most folks, um, but in the time we had, we, could, we addressed what we thought were the most serious issues. Now, the, the density issue is what a lot of people is, is top of mind because it's coming and, and it's getting, um, some of it's almost through application, some at the beginning, so it, it, it's something that's top of mind. And so think about um, some sort of process so that we can get this addressed because um, obviously we couldn't do everything in these, you know, we had 16 hours of time after we had the um, stakeholder meetings. So we need a longer conversation on that. So I, I, I think four people have asked pretty much the same thing. Um, so I imagine that's a good sample of, of what the feeling is here. So, I, so you're heard and we're gonna recommend that a a, s a second or another, or however many processes are needed to help address that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'd like to understand, I don't understand, the process of you're going to build all of these roads and then the thousands of people are going to come and the builders are going to come and build the places, or you're just throwing out these lovely plans of the roads, telling us we should have them, but in the meantime, the builders are here, ready to build, and we're going to have thousands of people without those roads. Like, what's the process? Okay, got it, I heard you. Um, I, I'm gonna answer the question, but I just wanna talk about the difference between a road and a street. A road is an, a rural idea. I know we all use that term interchangeably, but it, um, if you want to increase your quality of life in your town, start calling the streets in town streets the street implies that there's things on the sides, there's homes, there's buildings, there's shops, there's commercial, there's pedestrians, there's cyclists. Street encompasses all the user groups. Road 
is just about the cars. And it's usually a rural idea between cities. And so in your policies, in your discussions and so forth, focus on streets. And every, every street in your town should be called a street. If it's a road, it's probably detracting from your quality of life and it's probably implying a higher speed limit than you want. So anyway, just a point of clarity that you probably want to talk about streets. That being said, um, I guess I've kind of answered this a couple of times, so I, at the sake of repeating, you have inadequate streets already, even if nothing was developed. You know, we've, we've heard from a lot of folks that um, they're hard to cross, they're too fast, there's all these issues with them today and it's too focused if there's any construction, and we heard if there was, if it was closed for a crash or something, there was issues. So you probably have an inadequate street network now, and even if they develop at half the density that's being proposed, you're gonna, you're gonna still have problems. You wanna address these things simultaneously, by the way, not, it's not uh, one order. I would just add that the the design of the streets here, one of the most powerful tools that you have to regulate the kind of building, the form of development that you're getting. So the, the development pressure is here. When we talk about the units that are coming, not all of those are approved, but we do know that there are applications. We do know that there's developer interest. We've heard from some of those in stakeholder interviews. So it's, it's at your doorstep. And if you, what we hear you saying is that you want a different future than the one that seems to be happening. And if you want a different future, you've got to think differently about what you're, what you're doing today. I think that that starts with the streets. Um, Ian, you can talk through the A and B streets because this is one of the frameworks that we use to try to influence the form of development. But the other way is through the OP process and other uh, planning processes that are happening right now. And so staff would be able to talk about those a little bit more and how to, um, how to be involved in that process and how to influence that process. But there's, there's multiple prongs that I think staff is trying to come at this from. Uh, one is a design standpoint, but another is a regulatory standpoint. So Andrea, could you get the lights? Because these slides are pretty dim and they're important. Um, I actually wish we had a lot more time because there's so many uh, design principles we could go over that would be helpful. But this one's particularly helpful. So this is a, a street network um, and these we're gonna call these red lines A streets. And what this means is that the buildings hold the street, the front, doors and windows face the street, and it creates a very nice walking environment uh, when you have the natural surveillance. You don't want the back fence facing the street because then you're all by yourself when you're walking, and it's particularly uncomfortable for women, uh, families, um, to walk in a place where there's just you and then the, and then the traffic. You, you want the buildings facing the street. And that's what you see in a lot of the historic streets around town, is the buildings face the street. Yeah, the other thing is too, that when you're walking along, you're not crossing driveways all the time. So you're not um, interrupted, and the sidewalk's not going up and down and that kind of thing. So it, it makes for a, a very nice walk. And this is some examples of what A streets can look like. So this is what we're talking about. Now this is, happens to be a dense community, but the walking environment is fantastic. You've got these beautiful trees, you've got this um, green space, and um, when you actually go to this place, and I've been to this place several times, everyone's walking, everyone's out, everyone's socializing on the sidewalks. And that's a um, A Street on an old uh, Main Street. This is Chicago with an A Street, but much, much, much more density. And this is a collector street, which is a, a busier street in the community. And the same thing, there's no driveways on that street and it's across from an open space. So there's always uh, folks walking along there. So that's the A street and then if you have an open space, you want to hold it on all sides with natural surveillance so that people feel comfortable using it. 
And then every other street is a B street. And that's where you have B for back of house. That's where you have access to parking, servicing, uh, loading, utilities, all that sort of thing gets arranged on the B streets. Now in some cities, they have um, the B, they don't need a B street because they have an alley that serves that same purpose or lane. But the idea is you get this, oops, this, this fantastic um, walking environment and you still are able to service the properties. So if you superimpose over the buildings, see that sort of the dark area here? That's where the parking, servicing, and so forth is, whether it's an alley or, um, or a B street. And that's, those are the little driveways going in. So what does this look like, the B street? So you can still have buildings front them, but that, that's where you have access to these parking garages, or in the case of alleys, access to servicing and, and utilities and trash pickup and, and that kind of thing. And here's a, a this, we designed this plaza and it's all surrounded by A frontages. So that's a very popular plaza because people feel comfortable uh, there and there's no driveways interrupting the, the walking environment. This is a, a relatively new development. It's on a former Navy base that went, uh, that got decommissioned. And in this one picture, there's low, medium and high density housing. There's live work buildings, there's offices, there's retail, there's parks, and there's a waterfront with, with the trails, and there's an elementary school just in the corner here. So it's got just about everything you want in a town right in the same photograph. And those, that's the waterfront, and that's a, one of the parks. And these are the A streets, and so this is, if you go for a walk, these are the streets you'll be on. These are the streets that folks drive along, and that creates the image of this of this town. And those are the B streets or alleys. So some are alleys, some are B streets, but that's where all the parking is and the back of house stuff and deliveries. And I'll show you what these look like in real life. It, it, is, it looks a little confusing from the sky, but on the ground, this is what it looks like. This is, so this is a typical street right here. And those are the, the homes. Highly walkable street, high quality of life. People sit and drink iced tea on their porches all the time. And this is what the back of the house looks like uh, and the alley. So all that clutter, all of those um, driveways and stuff are, are off the A streets out of the way. This is medium density housing. Again, fantastic walk, beautiful streets. And this is what the alleys look like. This is very high density. And now they don't have um, just surface access garages, it's just like um, the lady mentioned, they have a uh, parkade back there. So in the center of their block, they have a parking garage lined with buildings. And it, um, you rarely ever go by that unless you're actually going into the garage. So when you're walking past here, you're walking down A streets and it's, it's really handsome. You don't get that sort of missing tooth in the smile of the street. You know, you, you're always engaged with nice buildings. And this is the, um, this is the retail street. It has on-street parking, and it's a very nice wide sidewalk, and just like we're suggesting in your uh, West End Center. But the parking, which happens to be surface parking back here, is behind the buildings. And so if you're going shopping there, um, and you can't find an on-street space, you park back here. But it's out of the way, so you're not walking past um, empty or half-full parking lots and your, your city doesn't have an image of just being a bunch of parking lots. So it's a very, it creates a very beautiful outcome. And this is what we're trying to avoid, is this um, interruption of the sidewalk, having to cross all these driveways when you're walking, or this look. This is a, this is a um, relatively new um, subdivision in, in Brampton. And when you look down this street, it, cars live here. You know, it's just filled with driveways and cars, and, and what we call snout houses, where the driveway's up to the street. When you can have, um, you know, beautiful walking environments like this with windows and doors. So that's what we mean by engaging um, streets. And so on all those blue streets we showed you, this is the kind of um, direction you want to take. So you can create that highly walkable, highly valuable address. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so that's, it. that's that example. So you can turn on the lights again, please. Any more questions or thoughts? You know, wave, wave to her, she's got the microphone. 
And by the way, you can do, like I showed you, you can do that at any density. Remember we showed you low density all the way up to high density. You can, you can do it, it applies to any, any stream. Hey Ian, um, obviously we all applaud the idea of taking time to build neighborhoods, not houses. Um, in the and being able to create the structure so that you can walk and you can move through things and people would like to live in that place and actually stay there because it's a cool place to live rather than go somewhere else. My, my, the challenge that I see is, you know, I, I, I like your, the, the value system you put to things and your desire to make it human. Um, will, if the town because it's going to be the town who, who has the power to create the neighborhood. If the town creates a neighborhood the way that you would envision, do the developers have to follow you or do you have to follow the developers? That's a good question. So they have to, there's a whole bunch of regulations and provincial regulations, local regulations, design requirements and so forth. They have to follow those and they're going, being a developer, they're going to exploit every flexibility they have in that. Um, but I do think that, you're, that the town is revisiting some of those things with their official plan. So maybe there's an opportunity to change them. But that's really a question for the, the town's folks. I'm not uh, an expert on that particular uh, side of things. Hi. Would you say that this is an especially difficult town to build in? Uh, because of the long and narrow uh, way that it, that it, it's just, you showed that cute little picture there that was square and it had red lines in it and it was perfectly square. So it's easy to do something like that, but we have a long, long town. It stretches. Is this a very hard town to develop or to build in? That's a good question. Did you have the Savannah script somewhere with the, the build with the sequence? So um, this is not the first place to develop along the waterfront in a, a linear way. I think the issue here is that somebody built a highway just behind it. And if, if that highway were two kilometers further south, you could actually get a really nice street network um, like those other places. And you're gonna see in a moment um, but is it too late for that for us? I mean, do we have to undo in order to do? Is it too late? It is almost too late. Um, and that's why we feel very strongly about you need to do what you can. Um, but yeah, that I, I would say that there's been some transportation planning errors made. And um, because you're kind of hemmed in now by 26. And so, and it's such a long distance between those roundabouts that it's, it's created a, a serious long-term problem that's starting now because you, you only have one street. So are you the developer or, or the builder or who are you? <laughs> that's a great question. I'm a consultant and um, we design um, new cities and expansions to cities and we, we do a lot of work looking at suburban areas and making them um, into town centers and creating more urbanity. Like your West End Center, that, that's a typical idea. We only spent about an hour on it because we had to do other things as well. But the idea is that instead of just doing parking lots with drive-through uh, restaurants and so forth, maybe it could have a bit of a block structure to it with a main street and a public space to bring in what I would call urban principles. So that's, that's what we do and we, um, we do it in cities all across Canada and the United States. Do you think it's too late for our town? What do you think? Tell me the truth. <laughs> you can't handle the truth. No, 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 I no. can <laughs> handle you and the truth. Um, the truth is that a bunch of mistakes have been made it's going to be very difficult to, I wouldn't say solve them, but minimize them. It's not going to be perfect. Nothing I've drawn is perfect, but it will help a lot. If you do nothing, 
um, and hope for a silver bullet to come along somehow, these opportunities that you have now will be precluded and you'll be in a real pickle uh, for the next forever. Thank you, I'm satisfied so, with that answer. Okay. Yeah, and Savannah, um, I was just asking Andrea if she could find the Savannah script because um, on the river they developed a very thin veneer of connected buildings just like you did. However, they had the benefit of developing more of their town prior to World War II. And after World War II, the transportation philosophy changed and it was all about driving fast. It wasn't about connectivity and it wasn't about, it wasn't about scale, it wasn't about livability. It was about getting from A to B quickly. And that, um, I call it motordom, that way of thinking, uh, contributed to Highway 26 getting built. And it was built in the most convenient place. Unfortunately though, the philosophy for that, that road, it's a road, um, doesn't help your town. And so we have to deal with it. Um, if, we, if we don't change 26, um, it, I think your, your problems are gonna be much more serious. So I think you need to try to affect it as much as you can. It's gonna be difficult because their philosophies are different than yours, your, your values are different than theirs. But I think they are planning another highway further out at which time that really long distance travel will be in a more appropriate space between cities and around cities, not in them or in towns. So I, with that coming, I think there should be hope that you could do something with 26. Now keep in mind, probably the people that you have access to and your staff has access to immediately at the MTO probably aren't allowed to agree with us. They are probably not senior enough to say, yeah, we can change that. So eventually we have to get high enough in the MTO to somebody who can go against the philosophy that built that street relatively recently, or that road rather, relatively recently. So it's gonna take somebody with judgment and empathy and probably enough um, experience and wisdom to think, yeah, Wasaga Beach is right, we can't do this and expect a good outcome. And I think the province deep down actually wants the cities and towns of Ontario to be successful. But with that kind of um, road hemming in your uh, town, um, it's, it's not gonna be pretty if, if that road's left unaddressed. It really needs to be addressed. Yeah, we all need hope. I'm gonna try, try and give you a bit of hope. All is not lost. Um, the reason we brought Ian and team in here is what we are seeing is there have been some mistakes made in this town. I'm not gonna lie to you. On the transportation front, on the planning front, we're seeing a bunch of applications come in that are isolated, they don't relate to each other, they're not connected. Our fear is that we're not gonna deliver the kind of community that you're all looking for. This process is to help us create a bit of a structure. What planning staff are gonna do, what I'm gonna do, we hear you loud and clear. That the, and the issue is not necessarily that density is bad, it's how the density is being designed and how it's being proposed. There are some beautiful high density communities right around the world, but the design elements have not been properly thought through in my opinion. So I think we're gonna build on the structure that Ian and team have proposed We'll take a look at the land uses, we'll layer that on top, and then we'll take a look at creating a secondary plan that will go in the official plan, and that will help provide some guidance to these developers that are knocking on the door, so we can say, listen, when you come here, here's what we expect from you, so that the whole is actually better than the individual parts. So, um, and again, this is not easy. This should have been done 20 years ago. We're here. We need to do the best we can today. Um, and again, I, I think Ian's being honest with you, I'm being with, honest with you, this is not easy. We're into some challenging discussions with MTO. I've certainly gone to battle with them many times in my past. It's not, it's not easy, but it's not impossible either. So 
Um, we're going we're gonna to do our best to, to try and knit this together into the best plan we can. Uh, and again, we heard all of your concerns loud and clear. Yeah, Trevor, uh, I see a six, six months. So uh, over the next couple months, we'll take this structure. Sorry? Nope. No, we're going to move fast. Uh, yeah, so we'll uh, hopefully before Christmas. Get, getting this? Okay, six months. Uh, so we'll, we'll pull this together again. This will not be the last time we will talk with you. We're happy to come back. And we will uh, look at the land uses, the built form, et cetera, lay it on this structure and come back and share that with you in the not too distant future. Okay. And so with that, um, I just want to thank all of you for coming Monday on Tuesday. For those of you who came with, for the stakeholder interviews, um, I think the common denominator that links everybody in this room, staff, residents, business people, everybody, is we all care deeply about this community and we want the best for it. And so I really applaud that you came out and shared your ideas, your thoughts, your concerns, and we heard you and I think working together and, and supporting each other through this will we'll end up with a better place than we would otherwise. So I'm going to end it now because I think it's time. Um, so thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Thanks.